It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. As the 20th century dawned, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was still at odds with the United States, a country that had provided fertile soil for the growth of their faith, but also a country they felt alienated from. Some of the things Mormons did to keep themselves separate from the outside world actually ended up helping them reconcile with it. In their efforts to build a self-sustaining Great Basin Kingdom in the West, they sent missionaries back to the eastern United States not to preach their restored gospel per se, but to learn at universities, to advance in fields like law and medicine. This changed the church. In his new book, Thomas W. Simpson argues that American universities played a key role in making Latter-day Saints feel at home in America again. In this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast, Simpson joins us to talk about his new book. It's called American Universities and the Birth of Modern Mormonism. It's a story about the tensions that come along with being a people set apart and a people trying to fit in. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And please take a moment to rate or review the show in iTunes. I really appreciate hearing from people about what they like about the show. Thomas W. Simpson joins me today here in Salt Lake City. Thanks for coming on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Of course. Glad to be here. Well, I wanted to begin by talking about two figures that play a prominent role in the book, Romania Pratt and Hannah Sorensen. These are two Latter-day Saint women. And, and forgive me for starting off with a little bit of a mini lecture, but I want to kind of set the stage a little bit, especially for listeners who aren't familiar with Latter-day Saint history. So here's a quick little thing to set the stage. From the late 1840s, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints migrated westward from the United States to what soon became the Utah Territory. And based on their distinctive religion and their experiences uh, wrangling with unfriendly neighbors and having issues, they began to establish this Great Basin Kingdom, uh, as it's been called. And Brigham Young was the leader of the church, and he had political and ecclesiastical oversight, and he spent a lot of time as the leader worrying about the relationship of Mormons to the United States. And so he hoped that they could, in many ways, become a people sort of set apart. There was a strong strain of separatism uh, to the new Mormon colony, but at the same time, there were still connections with the United States. And so it became increasingly apparent that Mormons couldn't do it out here on their own. They they were going to need some outside help, and people were going to be coming through anyway, especially uh, some of the help they needed were in things like law and medicine. So that kind of sets the, the stage for the project. But So let's look at this fascinating figure in the book, Romania Pratt. Talk about her. Who, who is she? So Romania Pratt is one of the first Latter-day Saint women in the 1870s to be set apart by high-ranking church authorities to uh, pursue higher education in medicine. Um, so there's a core group of women, including another one I talk about at length in the book is Ellis Reynolds Ship and that you know and uh, Martha Hughes Cannon. But there's the, there's this first group of women that's authorized by Brigham Young um, and set apart by the church to go pursue the medical degree, most often at the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia. Um, so these women are traveling 2,000 miles east to pursue um, the MD. And what makes Romania Pratt really special in my mind is that she goes beyond what Brigham Young had articulated as a, as a limited and pragmatic endorsement of medical training. Um, Brigham Young basically wanted medical training uh, for emergencies, um, but he, he was really careful about not wanting to undermine some of the divine principles of healing that are found in the Book of, Book of Mormon and, and um, other revelations um, to Joseph Smith. So, so there was always an, an ambivalence or a little bit of a wariness about how far medical training should go for a, for a devout Latter-day Saint. Even medical science at the time was a bit shaky, too. There was questions about Thompsonian medicine and yes. that sort of thing. Did that play into Brigham Young's calculus? Absolutely, absolutely. And there was some suspicion, um, as you find often today, some suspicion that the medical profession might 
lead you astray and maybe you're better off with home remedies or maybe you're better off with the community's wisdom about healing, uh, you know, rather than consulting a doctor at every turn. Uh, Why yeah. women primarily for the for pursuing medical oh, training? Excellent question. Um, right. So, so there was a real concern about Mormon women kind of suffering um, the indignity in many ways of, of having to turn to Gentile doctors all the time, especially male doctors. Um, so Latter-day Saints would call non-Mormons Gentiles. Right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so there was a concern that there would be a, a kind of what, a, a danger in some ways to female modesty or, um, or, or just uh, an inability to rely on the community's help and, and you know, a trusted physician in a situation where women needed medical attention. So the idea Especially, we're talking yeah. childbirth and stuff. Exactly. Too, as well, exactly. That kind of thing, Obstetrics. Yeah. yeah. Gynecology, you know, yeah. it's so the idea on Brigham Young's part was that yeah, if Mormon women trained, Mormon women could attend to other Mormon women. Um, that would be ideal. Um, so there, it's interesting. I think there are some conservative assumptions about gender in play here and some progressive ones as well, right? Yeah, you know? it's an interesting so, yeah. mix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are some general LDS attitudes toward women? Obviously, polygamy was happening at this time. Yes, yes. And, and I think what's especially fascinating to me and one of the things that drew me into the project at first was um, looking at the 1870s and seeing a magazine like The Woman's Exponent. So in, in, in The Woman's Exponent, you'll find justifications or endorsements for polygamy, but you also find notices in this newspaper, in, uh, in you know, this periodical, for Mormon women saying, look, the University of Michigan is opening its doors to women. I think this happens in the second issue mm-hmm. of The Woman's Exponent mm-hmm. in the early 1870s. They're saying, look, the University of Wish- Michigan is open to women. Take advantage of this. Um, you know, this this is something that's to be celebrated, and so it's in many ways, I would say, a feminist magazine. I mean, it's 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 explicitly advocating the rights of women um, in Zion and throughout the world. I mean, this is the this is kind of the slogan of the woman's exponent. Is it on the masthead or exactly, something? Exactly, it's on the masthead. Them. Yeah, and um, and so they're they're encouraging women to take advantage of these opportunities. And Romania Pratt is is at the center of of that interest. One yeah. of the tensions that she is negotiating at the time is the relationship between that you kind of hinted at earlier between revelation and church governance, uh, yes. ecclesiastical authority, and also then professional expertise. Yeah. Talk about that element of her uh, negotiation. Definitely. I think this is what's most fascinating about her because you see in the official blessing that she receives from the church, there's, there's an ambivalence about saying we're encouraging you to pursue this training. We trust that it's going to be of great benefit to our community. But we also add a, a prayer that people's faith will not be crowded out by your expertise, your scientific expertise. Um, so so the authorities, in, in many ways, are, are trying to walk that tightrope. Romania Pratt, I think, is bolder and more confident in saying that her scientific training and expertise can absolutely be reconciled with Mormon faith. And I, we see this in the book that um, that she's built right after Brigham Young dies in 1877, just a few months later. She's she's being endorsed by the Deseret News. They're recommending that everybody seek out her, her aid for, for health care. And Romania Pratt is saying that, you know, if we're not careful, um, you know, if, if we're too reliant on our own limited understandings of how healing happens. There's a danger that we can become naive and, and there's, a, there's a danger that, uh, that just this limited knowledge is actually obsolete, it's actually dangerous, and it's potentially lethal for Mormon women and for, for um, their children in, in childbirth. So she's saying our, our limited understanding can actually, actually be fatal. Um, and and result in the desolation of hearts and homes. I think is a really powerful phrase that she uses. Yeah, she's fighting right. against this idea, this populism idea. Yes. The idea that yes. sort of every person can you know be a doctor in essence, or every or in a sense, or every every person has access to everything they need to know. And that that populism, I use that as a, it's as a theological term or a religious term from the 19th century. Um, there's an old classic book in, in U.S. religious history um, by Nathan Hatch, The Democratization of American Christianity, where he talks about this kind of populism as 
really a dominant theological mode in the 19th century among egalitarian minded and democratizing minded um, Christian groups. There's a sense of elitism, like there are these yeah. religious people with training and they're elites and they're, yes. and, well, hey, we don't need any of that. Like right. we have the Bible, exactly. we have simple faith. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you find some, you find that strain a little bit in the Book of Mormon saying that distrust of the learned that they're going to, yeah, uh, they're going to take advantage they, of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, or they'll get prideful and yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. So, um, and, and so in this populist mode, really the untutored Joseph Smith is held up as, as a beautiful example of how people don't need formal education to understand everything that they need to know about divine truth and divine healing. So you can understand why it would be a very strong strain in Mormonism, this populist strain saying, again, ordinary people know everything. You know, God wouldn't withhold essential knowledge from ordinary people, right? Um, and so you can understand why it would be such an appealing idea. But Romania Pratt saying it's it's dangerous to think that we know everything we need to know. Yeah, there's this actual yeah. quote right here where she, uh, which you include. It says, it is not, she, she wrote this in the Women's Exponent, it is neither right nor safe for anyone with a smattering of knowledge picked up promiscuously to undertake the practice of medicine and go forth to hold the balance of life and death in their unskillful hands too often unnecessarily resulting in the desolation of hearts and homes, you said. So, and then, she, and then she ties into this other Mormon strain. So there's the Mormon strain of, of this populism, democratization, then this other Mormon strain of reason. She says, our reason, the greatest gift of God to man, was given us for the cultivation of our life here on earth. It presents a series of opportunities of transforming circumstances into eternal knowledge. And she ties into this idea of progress, eternal progression. Exactly. And so that's, I think, attention, and that's where... These Mormon students, I, th I think this generation of Mormon students is so important because they're some of the first ones to make this argument that you can take advantage of worldly education, secular education, outside expertise, and still be devoutly Mormon, right? And so I think Romania Pratt is making this crucial argument right after the death of Brigham Young that, no, this is consistent with Mormon belief and Mormon doctrine. And she's getting that, I think, by, by saying, yeah, this is related to the idea of eternal progression. This is related to the idea that the glory of God is intelligence. This is related to uh, Article 13, like seeking, you know, this, this idea that all truth is from the same divine source. And so there's no danger. Ellis Reynolds Ship says this earlier in the 1870s. She says, there's no danger of becoming too wise, right? If, uh, if all truth is, is from the same divine source, there's no danger in going out and, and um, searching for what other people have discovered and learning from it. And this is, I think, what, this is an affirmation, a really optimistic affirmation that becomes harder to hold on to in terms of the overall trajectory of the book. Like by the 1930s, I think we're finding that, that um, it's harder for both scholars and high-ranking church authorities to hold on to that affirmation that there's no danger in, in going out and, and yeah, seeking. You, you yeah, see, you actually see it early on as you bring yeah. up um, Joseph F. Smith, who gave Dr. Romania Pratt a blessing in 1881 yes. uh, with John Taylor. Uh, and there was, in this blessing, they were saying uh, that faith may not be crowded out of the hearts of the people of God through the science of medicine. So to, they exactly. include this like affirmation of her craft, but then this warning. Yes, Exactly, exactly. And you see this uh, in um, blessings for people going out and seeking training in the law, seeking uh, training. It's, it's basic. The mentality in the 1870s is, you know, on the part of church authorities, uh, Brigham Young, Joseph F. Smith, John Taylor, that the mentality is you're going to undertake a sojourn in Babylon, right? You're going to have this yeah. sojourn in Babylon, right? And, <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to spend time across enemy lines, as it were. Um, go get this expertise, acquire this expertise, and then, but but don't be influenced by the surrounding culture, right? Just go acquire this expertise, come back and use it so that we can keep building the kingdom of God here. We can keep building an independent um, and largely separate society. And so there's basically, I think, still an ideology. It's interesting. I think there's an ideology of separatism, but I mean, there's there's an appreciation of the wisdom that's out there that yeah. it's needed. Um, and there's a certain respect for that, but the idea is there's a danger that the students are gonna are gonna become apostates. Yeah, and there's a, a little bit of a fear that if they spend too much time in Babylon, they'll become of that world. Um, and so the idea is, yeah, go out, spend a little bit of time, enough time to acquire this expertise, but then come back and 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 don't ever 
think about don't ever think about leaving us or or betraying the faith yeah come back and yeah. then we can make more of a self-sustaining uh ongoing medical practice here in utah yes. it wasn't just the hierarchy and the men who were concerned about this you right. raised this other figure uh who was also more than ambivalent about education hannah Sorensen. she's yeah, yeah there was no ambivalence <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 and and i'd never heard of her before but she makes for a great comparison uh, with romania pratt herself talk about her background and, and what her story was so right so hannah Sorensen, I find to be a, a fascinating figure um so she receives her medical training and is an accomplished uh doctor herself in in denmark and uh, in the mid 19th century um, she converts to Mormonism, as I recall, in the 1860s, I believe. And she's, she's ridiculed, she's vilified, um, she's, uh, she, she loses her professional status and respectability as a result of converting to Mormonism. Um, so she arrives in Utah and is, is practicing, uh, she's assisting thousands of women with childbirth, and, and she's, uh, she's a really vital presence in the Mormon community in terms of uh, um, taking care of women um, who are going through um, childbirth in, in often very difficult circumstances. And so Hannah Sorensen develops this mentality. I say it's a, it's a, I say in the book, she's populist to the core. <laughs> and she's she, got a chip on her shoulder yeah, she about does, it too. Because, and for very understandable reasons, I have a lot of, um, I, I think it's, it's entirely legitimate and understandable that she would be very suspicious of of the medical profession because she was so wounded um, and exiled right you know, she was she was exiled from her profession and um, and so she ends up being a figure a kind of cantankerous figure yeah. uh, who is who is telling young what she's writing these letters in to the, the young same women periodicals inside. that the other pro education articles exactly. are appearing in. that's what's so fascinating to me is that there's nothing you know, everything's contested. Everything's fluid. There's nothing monolithic about the Mormon attitudes toward higher education in this period. Um, and so I think it's incredible that that the women's magazines are giving something like equal time. I, say, I end up saying I think they give more than equal time to the pro-education voices, which is why I think they went out. But um, but Hannah Sorson gets a lot of airplay to say, "Don't get educated. You yeah, don't." She's need saying, it. "You do yeah. not need to make these pilgrimage." I love that she uses the word pilgrimage yeah. because I think it really is a pilgrimage where students are experiencing a transformation of consciousness and identity. She's saying, "Don't and make a these sense of devotion to it." Yeah. Exactly. Don't make these pilgrimage to these wicked cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. You don't need and and she uses this language that's reminiscent of. Um, what Joseph Smith was going through as a young man, she's saying, if you consult 10 doctors, 20 doctors, you're going to get different opinions from all of them. And how are you supposed to know which one is true? Right? How are you supposed to know people which... people saying it today. You'll exactly. Say that. How yeah. are you supposed to know which one is true? And she said, the only way to know what's true is to go straight to the source. It's right? like a and Joseph we, Smith tale, like Joseph really trying is. to decide between religions, exactly. which one's true, go straight to the source. Exactly. She's saying same with medical science exactly. here. While exactly. other Latter-day Saints are saying, no, we need to exactly. uh, learn. And, yeah. and there's this incredible woman who's write, writing at the very same time that Hannah Sorensen is writing, a woman who writes under the name Cactus. And you I, couldn't identify her for I sure. Right? Her. Yeah. So I yesterday I ran across Lisa Olson Tate, who maybe you know has yeah, done yeah. great work in Mormon women's history. And she'll tell you all more about this soon. But she came up to me yesterday and she said, I know who Cactus is. You know, and I can prove it. Yeah. So and she so, can prove it. Yeah, and she can prove it. So this um it's it's I have a footnote where I say I have a hunch. I said the best match in terms of the dates from the Michigan alumni records and from what Cactus says in this correspondence, my best hunch is that it's Julia McDonald Place who went, who came, who became a, a doctor and a great writer in Salt Lake City. Um, did she? I don't know. You so don't want to scoop Lisa, but no. did she tell you who it was? Yeah. So okay, this, it, so you it's, know, it's Julia McDonald Place. For... Yeah. So, but Lisa can give all the documentation. She she proved it. So I'm so excited that yeah. that she went out and did it and and just thrilled um, because that's I think she's a key figure. I there. think Cactus. Why is she I think writing Julia you know, that's a fantastic question. You know, and Lisa might be able to better answer yeah. that than I. Um, because there wasn't a lot of that in this. Yeah. And all, they also weren't directly yeah. debating either. They were right. just like, this is my position. This is the way it is. They weren't right. saying like, Romania Pratt's crazy. Right. Or right. Romania no. wasn't saying, Hannah Sorensen, don't listen to her. She's exactly. off the path. You no. Know? Yeah. So I'm not sure about the anonymity. and, yeah. um, But so Cactus or Julia McDonald Place is, is saying... 
you know, she has, she's not directly opposing Hannah Sorensen, but she is saying the university of Michigan is, um, she, she uses this, this rhapsodic language mm-hmm. about the university of Michigan saying, this is, this is the one place in the United States where people from any background can come. Any and faith. If, yeah. Any faith. And if they're, uh, if they're willing to do the work, they will be rewarded. And that's, I think my central argument in the book is that the American university was this unique cultural and institutional space for Mormons, especially in the 1880s when the, there's federal persecution, there's a raid, there's every reason for a kind of separatist mm-hmm. ideology to take root and take hold. And there are these students who are experiencing fairness mm-hmm. in the American university. They're experiencing uh, being welcomed, they're experiencing being received with hospitality, they're experiencing dignity. And I, I'm, I really don't think there's any other cultural or institutional space that offers them that. So it's, it's a space where Mormons can see, they can imagine being American. Yeah, they can in imagine, this university space. Exactly. They can imagine citizenship. They can imagine that they can be American without betraying the faith. And this yeah. is where the title of your book comes from when you're talking about American yeah. universities and the birth of modern Mormonism. Yeah. This, when Mormonism became less insular, when it, when it started yes. to have wider connections, this was the birth of that you place within the context of these university experiences that Mormons were having. That's my argument, you know, and that when I, when I say modern Mormonism, what I mean is a Mormonism that is at home in America, at home in the United States, and, and then at odds with itself more. So the conflict becomes less of a Mormon-Gentile conflict and more of an internal struggle for the soul of the faith. What is Mormonism going to look like in the 20th century? These big, big controversies about scientific evolution, academic freedom. And that's already playing out of these medical discussions between Romania uh, Pratt and and Hannah Sorensen and Cactus and these other people that are already uh, almost struggling over the soul of what Mormonism is at this point. Yes. And right. Can you, can you be formed by outside influences and still be a good Mormon. Yeah. 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 That's big, the big question. And it's obvious. I mean, there are a lot of people that would see that as traitorous. If uh, people who lost their homes, they're, they're everything. Of course. People who, yeah. who have such a strong antagonism for uh, the United States. And then, yes. so you can see, I mean, the, in the context of it, it makes a lot of sense why these tensions are playing out. Um, this is yes. Thomas Simpson. We're talking to him about his book, American Universities and the Birth of Modern Mormonism. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, what brought you into the project yourself. Give us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this particular topic. Oh yeah, it's a really um, complex story, and that I I think about it in a couple of ways. Um, I, I really didn't anticipate for the longest time that I would be interested in the academic study of Mormonism. I, I was a, I guess, starting in my late undergraduate years at the University of Virginia, I started developing a real interest in United States religious history, especially modern United States religious history since the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, religion and social reform. Very interested in the Protestant social gospel movement, um, so progressive era reform movements, exactly, late late 19th century, early 20th. Um, Then got very interested in Martin Luther King and his, his social justice movements and the way that they were formed by religion. You could have stopped in any one of those decades too, by the yes. way. Like there's so much to I know, look at right? There. Right. It's so rich. You know, and I think, you know, I had studied the history of Christianity for a long time and, and wasn't especially interested in modern religious movements. But then Was um, that the Masters of Theology? Yeah. So as an undergraduate history of Christianity and then yeah, and then an MTS that was basically focused on history of Christianity and religion in the United States. Um, and then back to Virginia for a PhD in um yeah, in European and American religious history. And Mormonism um, itself, in particular, wasn't necessarily there. You're looking more at social no. gospel progressivism yeah, and yeah, these ideas. Yep. Yeah. yep, but then I have all this, I have this deep, deep ancestry in the LDS tradition on my dad's side of the family. And so, I mean, going back to the time of the pioneers, but if you kind of trace it through my dad's line, you know, so I, I grew up with these these Mormon relatives I loved. I mean, I had these cousins um, who I thought were some of the coolest and smartest people in the world, you know, (laughs) these guys, you know, and we would just, we, so I grew up kind of with a really intimate acquaintance with Mormonism, but I didn't think of it as, I didn't think of my relatives as Mormons, you know, they were, they were just, they're your family, my family, my family. And so these were the guys that were, were sharing music with me that I thought was cool and teaching me about 
I mean, they were musicians themselves. I mean, one of my, my cousin, Kim Simpson is a, is a singer and songwriter in Austin, Texas, and has a PhD in American studies and is an authority on the history of American popular music. And, um, and my cousin Kendall was in rock bands in Salt Lake growing up and he was a skateboarder and, and they're both devout Mormons, you know, and they're, they're both, yeah. you know, they both really take their Mormonism seriously. They take their, and they take their education seriously. They sound like an, I'm a Mormon commercial. <laughs> no, I, I know, right. I don't mean to, I know, but what I mean to say is, so I, I had this, this, and your father had been this deep love. And my dad so went to he, BYU. Yeah. My dad uh, went to BYU. When yep. did he, so he, Spencer Flum and I was talking to him yeah. before the interview yep. said that your dad left the church around the sixties. He, so he would say he, the language he always uses is that he distanced himself yeah. and he's never taken himself off the, the membership roles. Yeah. Um, he was uncomfortable over some of the racial issues and things like that. Is that, I think that's fair to say, yeah. you know, I'm, I always hesitate to, uh, Assign um, one thing. yeah, to, to kind of, to speak for him on that question because his thoughts are so interesting and so complex. I and mean, he has deep, deep love for so many of the teachings of the church and, and, and I mentioned yesterday at BYU that he speaks with reverence in a lot of ways about the education that he got at BYU and the love of literature that he developed at BYU from 1960 to 1966. He became mm -hmm. a literature professor, just retired after 45 years of teaching. So he's, he speaks with real reverence about some of the um, Ivy League educated English professors that he had at BYU, yeah. you know, who were, who were teaching him. And, and so he's, you know, he, he's a really interesting figure that way. So I always, I, I grew up myself with a, re, a respect for the education that he received. And, um, and again, these cousins of mine, and then I, I you know, I have an, an uncle who was on the music faculty at BYU for years and years and years. And so, but yeah, this ancestry goes back like through, if, you know, if you look back at my paternal grandmother, Simpson, her eight great grandparents were all in Nauvoo. And, oh yeah. So, you know, so I mean, right really, back, yeah. so I, I really was formed by, this tradition and um you know I, I joked at, at BYU yesterday when I was talking there that uh you know when I was a little kid and, and BYU won the national championship in football I was almost as excited as yeah. you know as my as my Mormon <laughs> relatives you know like it was it was a big deal to us and um and so it, it felt like part of it really felt like part of my heritage even though I've never been a member of the church and never been a practicing member so uh, late in my undergraduate years I read Jan Ships's Mormonism for the first time and I think that really opened my eyes to, to where eventually I could see, okay, this is how, this is how you can write responsible Mormon history as a non-Mormon. Yeah. Uh, right. And so if you have, if you put in the time and you develop the relationships, and I think I really, when I was looking for a dissertation topic, I really wanted something that would be relational. I knew I had to put in the time in the archives, but I wanted it to be a project where I was engaging in conversation with wonderful scholars and um, and I wanted it to be something that would allow me to reconnect with something I grew up in western New York hmm. so I grew up you know a couple of thousand miles away from these these cousins and these relatives that I loved and so the the research in Utah allowed me to reconnect with that family and and watch my cousin's kids grow up and yeah um, one of them was in diapers when I started this project and he's eye to eye with me now but, <laughs> but, so so it's been a, it's been a long journey but a, a beautiful way of of connecting with family and then just finding these stories I think these yeah, stories how did you the narrow it to the topic yeah. of the universities in exactly particular. so I didn't expect to find that I didn't know uh, anything about that history. And I think this history is a surprise to a lot of people who are encountering the book, too. So what I was looking for first was Mormon responses to Wilford Woodruff's manifesto. I wanted to know, like, after all this costly and principled resistance for to years. federal authority. Yeah. After all this resistance, how is there... How does patriotism happen, right? How does Mormon patriotism Because it became emerge? super patriot. Right, you know? right. So yeah. that was my big question. And, um, and there's been a few theories about it that, you, that you've yeah. seen. The, the, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so, but I've never been persuaded that coercion, right? I mean, it's a, in terms of the, the fundamental psychological problem that I was working with was coercion doesn't produce loyalty, right? You know, right. pressure doesn't produce right. love, right? right? You know, you just, it, it doesn't... Um, so I was trying to figure out, you know, especially again, zeroing in on the 1880s when the raid is happening. And what, and so as I started looking at um, Davis Benton's Guide to Mormon Diaries and Autobiographies, I was looking for responses to the manifesto. It's a wonderful collection of diaries and autobiographies, that uh, this guide that Benton has. I started seeing some examples of Mormons who had gone and received this training at the great 
new American universities starting in the 1870s and the 1880s. Um, I found some of the obvious examples. At first, I found Witso uh, going to Harvard in the 1890s. I found that Talmadge had gone to Johns Hopkins yeah, for a little And they became bit. general authorities. Exactly. In the church, so I thought, yeah. okay, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. But then I found more and more examples like these women. I and, hadn't heard of yeah. uh, many of these figures. Exactly, exactly. And so, so you've got people going to Cornell. You've got people going to the University of Michigan. You've got people going to Columbia. Stanford. Um, yeah, Stanford by the 1890s. Yeah, Harvard by the 1890s. The University of Chicago by the 1890s. And so I thought in the 1880s, again, this is where I think an ideology of separatism could and should have taken hold. Um, and in in my graduate education, I was thinking about some other for, other cultural forms of separatism. Uh, and as I started to teach and, and study more about um, African American religious history, I was studying the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. I was studying, you know, this uh, here's a here's a strongly separatist organization. They want to have their own independent institutions. They don't want to be part of a society they see as degenerate, a society they see as corrupt. And I was really interested in, okay, what allows Malcolm X or what allows um, W.D. Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, to develop this more inclusive vision to say, oh, you know what, we actually, it would make sense for us to have a multiracial society. It would make sense for us to have more of a sense of belonging in this country. Like we're not really going to be fully separatist. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up What I ended up finding is all these stories of Mormons who are having these exhilarating experiences in universities in the 1880s. Again, I think they're figuring out that they can be devoutly Mormon and uh, and loyal as Americans at the same time. And so one way I talk about this is that I think the Mormon student experience is a Malcolm in Mecca experience, right? That you're 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 getting this vision of a when new Malcolm way X of went being. on pil- yeah, so he goes on the pilgrimage he goes on the and he Hodge, says, "Whoa, yeah. I've never seen all these people of different races yeah. together, and it's beautiful, yeah. and it's um, and it's 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 not going to make me, uh, you know, a a worse Muslim. It's yeah. actually you know, quite the contrary. It's going to yeah. make me better. I'm going to be a more, you know. And so, so what I find is with the Mormon students, I think the the experience is so exhilarating precisely because it feels like spiritual growth." So it's not it's not just that they're being welcomed, but they're being challenged and they're being inspired. And mm-hmm. they say, like, again, this is consistent with they're seeing it as consistent with Mormon ideas about education, about about eternal progression, about, you know, um, Benjamin Clough thinks, yeah, of course, what is what's more Mormon than learning everything you can, yeah. right? You know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll get to Clough too, but before we do, I also wanted to talk about some of the earlier Mormons who went for training. We talked about the women who often, I think in most cases, did medical pursuits, but when it came to men, a lot of them started focusing on law. So talk about Brigham Young's relationship to these men who were the first to go back to be educated in legal matters. Yeah, so this is going back to the 1870s, and um, so Brigham Young yeah, is is um, feeling besieged um and he's he's not um mistaken in that feeling right so there there are people really threatening his his power his assets um and so he realizes that uh a lot of lawsuits yeah exactly exactly (laughs) a lot of litigation and so he realizes that it that mormon trained lawyers um a trained, sorry, trained Mormon lawyers who are, who are getting degrees at places like the University of Michigan could really be an asset in terms of um, protecting, protecting um, these holdings and these, yeah, and this independent status out in, um, in, in terms of the Mormon kingdom building project. So, uh, yeah, uh, one of his own, he's sending a couple of his own children, um, you know, and a range of other folks. And, but again, there's this real ambivalence about the legal profession. It's, it's seen by Brigham Young and a lot of other Mormon leaders as a dangerous profession, precisely because they've seen up close how um, how menacing and and how manipulative. Um, yeah, lawyer jokes, lawyers can basically. Be. Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. This is nothing uh, unfamiliar. Right? Um, so, with so, apologies yeah. to all lawyers who are listening. We exactly. Love you exactly. All. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, there's a real fear and a real ambivalence, um, and you see this coming through again in the in the blessings of lawyers who are being sent off to pursue this training. They're saying, look, it's, this is potentially very useful, but potentially also quite dangerous. So, so be careful not to be corrupted by 
um, outside influences. Um, it's very symbolic that yep. he's setting them apart. You use the term set apart. Yes. That's when it, yes. within the LDS church, they lay their hands on the head yes. and pronounce a blessing on someone yep. and set them apart as some particular role. And this yeah. is typically done for missionaries. Exactly. So they're setting these apart as missionaries, but with some really interesting differences. What kind of counsel is Brigham Young giving this? Yes. Is he saying, go teach the gospel while you're out there? What kind of things no. is he saying to them? No, almost never. I mean, occasionally in these early cases, they'll say, engage in some um, proselytization if if you have time but in the vast majority of cases they're saying your this is an academic mission this is your mission is to go out and acquire this expertise and come back and um he would talk about examples to too like maybe you mm-hmm. can look when you're out there and you're doing good work people will see that mormons aren't exactly. these crazy weirdos so exactly. that's nice like that's preaching in a sense yes right? yes exactly and i think that goes both ways so that that there's a sense in which the mormon students become exemplary in a way uh, romania pratt talks about this and uh ellis reynolds ship i mean she's saying that really humanizes mormons uh for a lot of non-mormons and then on the other end... Yeah, they're preaching too, to exa- the Mormons. Yes, yes, In exactly. the same way. Exactly. And, you know, it, right. And so there's a real, yeah, mutual humanization, I think, that's happening, you know, that that, that really counterbalances a lot of the dehumanizing rhetoric that, that could be happening on both sides again. So, yeah, Mormon students are figuring out this is not Babylon. And then a lot of non-Mormons, I mean, you see this with the University of Michigan students, especially in the 1880s. Um, you see non-Mormon students um, electing some of their Mormon peers to really important student offices, and just Mormon students are winning a lot of respect. Um, and then the American University itself, I think this this is true to the present day. I think the American University is is a great engine of diplomacy, right? I think almost no American institution makes the United States look better than hmm. the university. And you see today how the, the American university still draws people from all over mm-hmm. the world. And I think it breeds loyalty. You know, people go back with a, with a kind of, you know, I think it, more often than not, they're going back with a real love of the United States for the sports the teams. Yeah, no. <laughs> the sports team, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, there's a sense of like, I was taken care of, I was challenged, I was inspired yeah. when I was far from home. And, and this works for, for Mormon students. They're also at this time sort of still caught between polygamy and respectability. They're dealing with these issues. Josiah Hickman is one of the figures that yes. encounters this. What's his story? So Hickman, yes, in the late 19th century, um, is at the University of Michigan before statehood. And he's in a situation where he's, um, you know, I, as I recall, he's got, you know, he's got multiple wives living with him in Ann Arbor at different times. And finally, the first presidency says, hey, right, yeah. you got, you, <laughs> Wait you, a uh, minute. right, you know, this, there's a real danger here of, um, of you making the, the church look really bad. And, and so um, they tell him to kind of, you know, um, to keep up appearances um, in, a, in a kind of cleaner way um, in terms of the church's um, image. And, uh, and Hickman really struggles with that. And he, he ends up kind of trying to, he, he, has, he has this fabulous education um, and ends up coming back to Utah to teach in, um, in Mormon affiliated schools. And, and eventually it just doesn't work out that this is the era of not only Wilford Woodruff's manifesto of 1890, but then the second, the so-called second manifesto. Yeah, of it was like, we're serious this time. Like we yeah. will excommunicate you. And yeah. yeah. And so the church ends up in a position, especially by 1904, where they have to purge some, some people with really high level education like Hickman. Um, so it could, because they're an embarrassment. Um, yeah. so Josiah Hickman, um, ends up not really having much of a much of a career yeah and he could in have. academics yeah, yeah he could have he and it's probably been a key figure exactly this these... goes for benjamin clough as yeah. well um i think benjamin clough is a hugely important let's talk about figure. that because this is yeah. where mormons are starting to generate more education in utah so with all the concern about going abroad and sort of being exposed to babylon having problems well one solution yeah. to that is to have people get trained then come back here and make our own education uh, systems here so the book talks about the origins of higher education in utah including the university that you're visiting this week here uh, brigham young university and also the university of utah which right where we're at here in salt lake is just uh, up the road here so let's talk about some of these key figures you mentioned benjamin clough he's one and the other one is carl Mazer, and they kind of represent a sort of hannah Sorensen romania pratt tension in the exactly. ways that they see outside education yeah absolutely um, so carl Mazer, again i have a lot of 
sympathy for for him he he's trying to get these institutions going i mean it's very ambitious thomas alexander was was really helpful for me on this the byu historian of the same period uh, this mormon transitional period of the late 19th and early 20th century um and alexander points out in his studies of of mormon education that it was really ambitious at this time in the 1880s and 1890s to start talking about any kind of colleges in more, you know, saying they were these, dreaming these, big, these, these, dreaming big. Yeah. And Carl Mazur's trying to run basically the whole thing. He's the head of the whole church education system. Um, and so he's really keen on making sure that, that Benjamin Clough, who's about half of Mazur, as I recall, Mazur's about 60 at the time and Clough is about 30. Um, he's really keen on getting Benjamin Clough back to help oversee mm. the Brigham Young Academy. And he doesn't want students going abroad. He doesn't want to spend trying, time. Yeah. Was it more because he wanted to establish something here or yeah. more because he was had that ambivalence toward, if you go, exactly. you might not come back? Yeah, it's really that same kind of Hannah Sorensen concern. So I think it's really important when you have people like Hannah Sorensen and Carl Mazur who were formed in Europe and have have kind of a suspicion of Mazur has a suspicion of secular education and, a, and a, a devotion to religious education that plays a big part in this. Um, so he's really passionately and understandably committed to developing Mormon um, educational institutions, you know, institutions that are run by Mormons for Mormons. And so, again, he recognizes the benefit of some outside training. But the, the end goal for him is to eliminate the need for going outside at all. So yeah. he's saying, let's build, let's get the, the Brigham Young Academy and let's get even he's, he's reluctant for Mormon youth to go even to the University of Utah. But he said, like, if that's that's OK, as long as they're not going outside the region. Right. So he really was suspicious of outside education. Um, he's saying, Benjamin Clough, come back and yeah. help me build this thing. Benjamin yeah. Clough's borrowing from Michigan. He's in Michigan, yes, right? And he's yes. going to come back yeah. and start to sort of initiate these summer schools at exactly. BYU. So Clough, I think, is he incredibly pivotal. Um, I often say he's a very difficult figure for modern, you know, for Latter-day Saints today to enshrine because, again, he's a kind of source of embarrassment because of his polygamy, polygamy and, his, yeah. you know, and, and, and other things he did in terms of his, you know, trips to um, Central America to try to um, prove the Book of Mormon. Yeah, yeah. And this so, is post-manifesto polygamy. Yeah, and exactly. Things took exactly. Him down. Yeah. So he's he's a tough guy to celebrate. Yeah. But I think he's hugely important um, for once. So while he's at the University of Michigan, he's saying, you know, again, to dismantle the populist argument, he's saying it's a sin to miss the opportunities that higher education outside the region affords. Right? He's saying he's saying it's actually it's actually a sin not to take advantage of outside learning, outside wisdom, outside teaching, yeah. right? You know, it's a really strong theological statement. Um, and then, as you say, Blair, he's um, he starts bringing some of the most respected mm. educators in the country to Utah yeah. in 1892, 1893 for these summer uh, institutes that are benefiting not just Mormon educators, but... Uh, but non-Mormon educators as well. And so it's a Let's remarkable... Let's get the statewide education going. Exactly. Let's have the best people come in here and tell us what to do. Exactly. Yeah. And it's good. These are really well attended. Charles Elliott, the president of Harvard, comes and speaks to 7,000 people at, at the Tabernacle, you know, Mormons and non-Mormons. You know, other... Uh, you know, and, and then eventually, you know, a, a little bit later, I mean, people like John Dewey are coming to Salt Lake and coming to speak, you know, to, to people who teach at the Brigham Young Academy. And I mean, it's really... Um, it, these are heady times, I say, yeah. <laughs> a couple yeah. of times in the book. I mean, it's, it's so I think um, Mormons are, are um, again, exhilarated, I think, by, by realizing. And, and there are these, these wonderful accounts in newspapers from the time of, of these compliments that these leading educators give to Mormon teachers saying, like, I've, they'll leave saying, I've, I've never met such a hardworking group. I've never met such an eager and enthusiastic group. Um, you've got a bright future ahead in, you know, in Utah education. And, and so people really soak this up and they, mm, uh, they, yeah. and they're getting people on board. are saying good getting, things about yeah, us. Yeah. yeah kind of exactly, a thing. exactly. The other thing at this time, Stanford, uh, university in California is becoming a destination school for Mormons. And that caused some internal tensions that play out in some of the other schools. We sort of skipped through that, but I thought Stanford would be a nice, uh, example to talk about 
internal tensions between Mormons themselves. And I was interested in the Swenson Jensen situation that yeah. revolved around evolution. Talk about that yes. and some of the tensions between Latter Day Saints. Yes, yeah. So it's it's a small um, Latter Day Saint community, but. Um, you see this at the University of Michigan at the time as well in the mid 1890s. Um, some real fissures and fractures starting to develop, especially around um, scientific evolution, and and again, which which becomes what a, a kind of heuristic or a kind of um, symbol, uh, you know, of what it means to be a good Mormon. Like, can, so can you be a good Mormon and embrace scientific evolution? Um, and there's some real debates really bitter debates that break out about this at Michigan and at Stanford among Mormons who are trying to hold on to a sense of religious community. They're trying to practice. They're trying to meet together, um, have sacrament meetings and things. But some of them are just really grating on each other about these questions. And, um, they, you know, they sense that they're in an environment that embraces scientific evolution. Um, David Starr Jordan is the president of Stanford, uh, is, you know, trained scientist and, you know, es espousing scientific evolution. And so there's a lot of a lot of influence, um, a lot of debate. You know, so, you know, Swenson, uh, John Swenson um, is is soaking this up. He's yeah, he's, he's learning. He these, loves. Yeah, yeah, he loves the freedom of the right, environment. Right. He's he's a little bit troubled by the teachings of scientific evolution at first, but he's coming around. And then um, P.J. Jensen is is bitterly opposed. Really feels out of sorts uh, at Stanford. Feels like it's it's not not a good environment for a true Latter Day Saint. And he's um, writing to the president of Brigham yes. Young Academy, George Brimhall, at this yes. time. She's corresponding with him, sort of reporting on other Latter Day yes, Saints. Exactly, exactly. Um, saying I'd be happy to I'd be happy to let you know who's um, who's keeping up with their yeah he says, devotions I, and who's not. I'm <laughs> very anxious to see. Uh, Swenson returned to our dear Utah and get warmed up by the spirit of the gospel. And he says yeah. that, you know, I'm happy to track down records of his tithing and ward activity. This would be a simple matter of righteously inquiring after his welfare. So yeah. he's got this, he's spying on people. Yeah, look out, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Right. And reporting on him, yes. And, and so this is sort of playing out these ideas like, can Mormons embrace evolution? Can they not? Yeah. And this there's this ongoing tension between anxiety about education and aspiration to be well-educated. Yes. And John yes. A. Widso is one of the most yeah. uh, prominent figures who's wrestling with this. He became an apostle in the LDS church. He's one of the first Mormon PhDs. Was who yeah. was he? Who was first? Was yeah. It? Oh gosh. I'm trying to think now. Um, so yeah, Joseph Merrill and, and John A. Witso. Yeah. We're right in that neck very and first, neck. right at the, right at the turn of the century. Right. So yeah. he becomes one of the highest ranking mm -hmm. authorities in the church. And I was struck yeah. by one of the quotes that you cited from something that he wrote to the youth of the church. Um, yes. And this is something that was ultimately published in a book as well that had wide reception within uh, within the church. Yeah. He says, uh, in the life of every person who receives a higher education in or out of schools, there's a time when there seems to be opposition between science and religion, between man-made and God-made knowledge. The struggle for reconciliation between the contending forces is not an easy one. This this is the line that, I, that hadn't struck me before. Okay. Uh, he says, it cuts deep into the soul and usually leaves scars that ache while life endures. Yes. There are thousands of young people in the church today and hundreds of thousands throughout the world who are struggling to set themselves right with God above and the world about them. He talks yeah. about this pain yes. that's in the process. Yes. And there's some beautiful language um, in his autobiography, In a Sunlit Land, um, he calls it, where he talks about arriving at Harvard for the first time and how helpful his... Um, his mentor in the field of chemistry was in helping him come to some of that reconciliation. Um, so he said it was just massively important for him to um, hang around this professor, Josiah Cook, who had had, had gone through the same struggles as a non-Mormon um, and had come to the conclusion as a chemist that um, as a Harvard, you know, right, as a Harvard professor in chemistry, um, that all I think the exact phrase is all nature is God's speech. Um, and so this is profoundly influential for Witso. Um, Witso feels that, okay, I can be, I can be a devout Mormon mm -hmm. and I can be a, a world-class scientist. He's plugging into yeah. an ancient, like a very long-standing Christian idea, the two books, you've got the book of yes. life and then the book of nature. Yes. Uh, yes. Both of these things and manifest God. Exactly. Yeah. And I think again, you know, as, as this plays out in the decades to come, there are, 
people, scholars and church authorities who struggle to affirm that they can be held together. Um, you know, there's by the 1930s, I say there's there's a really strong push in the direction of saying that religion and science oper- uh, occupy separate spheres. spheres. Yeah. Well, this yeah. is starting and to they, play they out in 1911. Really there's this big exactly. controversy at BYU, exactly. yep. a number of professors who'd received professional training and then come back to teach. Yeah. So this was the ideal. This is what they wanted. They yeah. wanted this school to have these great scholars. Yeah. What happened here? Yeah. So there's, right. So you get a, a cadre of professors, the Petersons, the Chamberlains, coming to BYU with with high level training in in a range of, of fields that ends up being problematic in the eyes of um, administrators like George Brimhall, who's the head of the um, Brigham Young University at the time, and uh, and some church authorities like Horace Hall Cummings, um, who's who's overseeing the education system. They're coming back and they're teaching. They're taking an approach to a range of subjects in a way that's exhilarating for for younger Mormon students in a lot of ways, but um, but presenting some. Um, some problems and some controversy. Like so, evolution, higher yeah, criticism in the Bible. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, pragmatic philosophy. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot going on that's interesting just in terms of epistemology here too. I think there's, I, I talk in the book about an issue in, of the improvement era in the first decade of the 20th century where Milton Benyon and Franklin West are writing about not about epistemology, about how knowledge and truth come to us. They're writing separate articles in the same issue. And yeah. Franklin West is basically making an argument as a physicist that um, that maybe maybe divine truth and maybe maybe prayer work uh, in ways that are similar to um, radio reception or, you know, or something, right. Radio communication, yeah. like maybe it's, using it's, a metaphor. it's invisible. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it's real. Yeah, right? right. And then Milton Empirical, Benyon, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so maybe we can, we can reconcile teachings about divine truth and modern science that right. way. And then Milton Benyon is saying in a different article that knowledge is essentially a private affair. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's essentially subjective. subjective yeah. And so they're saying very different. In and, the same issue. Of yeah, and I would argue irreconcilable yeah. things yeah, about. Mutually contradictory. I yeah. think so, I think so. Um, uh, but what's, what's fascinating to me is that these both get printed yeah. in the same issue, and there's a kind of fledgling and eclectic um, sense of, of what Mormon intellectual life can look like. But I think this is just before there starts to be more of a crackdown, more of an effort to say, no, we need to be more consistent, especially because you can imagine in Mormonism, questions are going to arise quickly about, well, do we literally mean that what Joseph Smith experienced had an objective reality to it? Right. Because if Mormon scholars are starting to say that knowledge is essentially subjective, and maybe you're going a little bit in this William James direction yeah, of saying it was psych- a psychological experience Joseph Smith encountered in his mind, or exactly, was it, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so tests, like multiple choice or true and false tests, start to be administered yeah. at BYU in this period about, like, do you think what Joseph Smith experienced was subjective in his mind yeah. or an objective yeah. reality? Right. Right. You know? And the and the right answer yeah. is objective. Right. right? Um, so so yeah, there's real controversy de- developing. Um, about, you know, where is this going with this pragmatic philosophy? Where is this going with the higher criticism of the Bible? Where is this going? Is this going to be damaging to young people's the, faith? The yeah. president of the church, Joseph F. Smith, at times getting yeah. very worried about this. He talks about wanting to avoid a theological aristocracy. He's yes. like, here are these highfalutin yes. philosophers who are bringing all these ideas, injecting yeah. them into Mormonism. And, and the professors, on the other hand, are saying, listen, if we're going to be involved in higher education, our, yes. our students are going to be confronting these ideas uh, Peterson, one of the professors, yeah. is saying, uh, I've labored under the impression that our young people who cannot avoid hearing about evolution yes. had better hear and read it in our church schools where they're pervaded by the Spirit of God and where they're taught doctrines of the church right along with it. So he's sort of introducing this idea of we need to include this in higher education. It's part of education in the country, but we can do it in a faithful environment. Why don't we do that? Yeah. But Joseph F. Smith is still saying no exactly. to this. Exactly. This is so interesting and so complex. I think, I again, I understand Joseph F. Smith's concern. Like, I think his fundamental concern, as he articulates it, is about class, right? As he's saying, and, and, and I think he's right to this extent, that there's a danger that as you, as an intellectual class in Mormonism develops, there's a danger that people might start to think that the intellectuals are the only ones with something to say mm-hmm. about 
really important matters mm-hmm. in Mormonism. And so, so sometimes church authorities are threatened by that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they recognize that, that scholars have an authority mm-hmm. that is sometimes largely separate from their priesthood authority. Or in the case of, you know, a Romania Pratt back then, right, you know, like women yeah. can, yeah, women yeah. can develop this authority or, or, or scholars um, in general can develop this authority. And so there can be a sense of rivalry, um, a sense of territoriality that, that emerges. But I think Smith's, Smith's concern is, yeah, that we're going to have kind of class division that's going to damage our communitarian spirit, our, our spirit of brotherhood, he would say that's been so beneficial in terms of building up the church. So there's a fear that, yeah, that intellectuals are going to get, um, are going to get uppity. They're going to get arrogant. They're going to get, um, kind of more influential than they should be. But at the same time, this argument, this, the scholars argument that you're mentioning that students need to know about this in a lot of ways, or, or at, at particular times really wins out, I would say. So in 1911, there's kind of a setback for the scholars. Well, they actually fire or yeah. remove several yeah. professors. It's a huge... Exactly. It's big controversy. And a lot of Mormons know about this. Yeah. They know this history, this controversy. But I found that what, what a lot fewer people know is, um, you know, we think back to the climate at Stanford. By 1925, the year of the Scopes trial, the year of the, monkey, the Scopes monkey trial um, in Tennessee over evolution being taught in public schools in Tennessee, in 1925, there's a Stanford-trained zoologist, Vasco Tanner, teaching evolution at BYU without incident. Yeah, yeah this right? new you know, leader comes in to replace right. the president, Franklin Harris, yeah. and the whole yeah. atmosphere changes. Now you have yeah. evolution being taught. This is just yeah. a few years after these other professors right. have been removed for that. So there's this all this oscillation, all this fluidity. And right, is so in, a, in, a, in 1925, there's much more of a, a sense again that we need outside expertise. And again, it's, I think, out of concern for the students in the sense, especially if they're going to go to medical school, they're saying like we want we want Mormon students to be able to go to the best medical schools. We can't shelter them and shield them. They just simply won't be qualified. Yeah. They simply um, so it's you can see these mentalities evolve and, and are fluid yeah. and are contested all the all the time. And it kind of re- revolves around this populism, you know, whether or not yes. you know, what's the proper level of. Like, we want to get education, but is there too much education, and does that threaten the faith? And you see some exactly. Latter-day Saints leaving the faith uh, as they get higher education, or other Latter-day yeah. Saints uh, becoming, in the eyes of other people, heretics, believing in yes. evolution and this type of thing. Yes, That's Thomas W. Simpson. He's a specialist in modern U.S. religious history. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Virginia and a Master of Theological Studies from Emory University. Now he's an instructor in religion and philosophy at Phillips Exeter Academy. We're talking about his new book, American Universities and the Birth of Modern Mormonism, 1967 to 1940. We'll be right back. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Over the course of a decade, in over 100 publications, we've sought to deepen understanding and nurture discipleship among Latter-day Saints and to contribute solid research about other traditions like Judaism and Islam. Brigham Young University has proven to be a supportive home for the kinds of faithful, rigorous scholarship we strive to produce. In all our work, we also strive to pay tribute to the exemplary life and ministry of Elder Neil A. Maxwell, our revered namesake. And we certainly couldn't do what we do without donors, subscribers, readers, and listeners. Thank you for your support. So we invite you to help us celebrate our 10th anniversary on Saturday, October 29th. Professor David F. Holland of Harvard Divinity School is delivering the annual Neil A. Maxwell Lecture. Dr. Holland's lecture is titled, Latter-day Saints and the Problem of Pain. You don't want to miss it, whether you can make it in person or watch the lecture afterward on our YouTube channel. That night, we'll also be announcing our brand new Maxwell Institute Advisory Board. So mark your calendars and join us on October 29th at 7 p.m. For more information, go to mi.byu.edu slash 10 years. We look forward to seeing you there. We're back with Thomas W. Simpson. He's a specialist in modern U.S. religious history, and his new book is called American Universities and the Birth of Modern Mormonism. So we've kind of talked about this oscillation that's happened where Mormons are reaching out for higher education. There's also some ambivalence, some skepticism, and even some outright opposition to it. Then they're developing schools in Utah, and you have BYU uh, trying to become a, a very good school, but then 
they're worried about particular things being taught. So there's professors that are fired. Then you have this renaissance where a new president of the university brings in people to teach evolution and all this. So it's kind of going back and forth. And then at the end of your book, J. Reuben Clark becomes a prominent figure here. He's an LDS church leader, and he comes into church leadership as a smart, trained, and experienced man. But along with that education that he had, he brings a wariness of intellectual pursuit. So talk about J. Reuben Clark and how he changed the trajectory of the story. Yeah, he's a really monumental figure in my mind. And, I, and I, um, I'm getting that partly from just, again, my, my conversations with with Mormon scholars today who you have connections with the church education system. And, and they say this, um, the speech that J. Reuben Clark gives in, in 1938 called the charted course of the church in education, which has a real chilling effect on, on scholars. I mean, it's the real tone of rebuke and condemnation toward people who have imported outside ideas and brought them in, especially to the, to Mormon religious education they let me know that this like this document still has real power in the church still gets circulated still gets endorsed and so that's in some ways why i felt confident in terms of the period is periodization of this book uh, to say okay i think by 1940 you've got some basic parameters in place about so the the populist current is still is still running through mormon life and the desire for tremendous achievement and the, and the aspiration is still a strong current as well. So Clark is a Columbia trained lawyer. Um, he's very highly educated, as you mentioned, um, but he's extremely concerned about the effect that outside theories, as he conceives of them, outside theories about pedagogy, about psychology, about sociology, about economics, um, he's very concerned that these outside theories are going to have a corrupting influence on Mormon youth. Um, and I think if you look also at Heber J. Grant at this time, um, who's the president of the church, back in 1921, um, when BYU was really starting to recruit uh, Mormon-trained PhDs, starting to pursue accreditation, start, you know, starting to endorse the teaching of evolution— Heber J. Grant in 1921 is saying, you know, I hate to think that BYU needs any sort of improvement because I love the institution so much, but I'm willing to recognize that I don't really have much expertise here. I'm, I'm going to let and the people... And maybe it's good business. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah I'm, right. <laughs> um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the, the experts, I'm going to let the people with the real education kind of determine the course of, of BYU in a lot of ways because they... I, you know, I trust them to. This is during that Renaissance. Right. That yeah, that sort of but then yeah. by night, so that's 1921, Heber J. Grant. Then I think by 1934, as I recall, he's he's gotten much testier, much more mm -hmm. defensive, like Clark, um, who's also a member of the First Presidency. Heber J. Grant is saying, and I call this an ultra populist position that I have not really detected among authorities and Mormons before, where Heber J. Grant is saying, we do not care what other people have to say about you know yeah about i have the quote particular. yeah i have yeah, the thanks, quote here but, and you're yeah, right it is yeah. it is striking to juxtapose this with yeah. joseph smith's uh teachings about um seeking all the good in the world exactly and and, and uh you know, the expansion of, uh, of the intellect. So Heber J. Grant says, if we have the truth and everyone in this body ought to have a testimony that we do have the truth, we do not care what other people believe or what their teachings are. Yeah. That's and, and this is, this is in a, um, a particular context, which is fascinating to me because what you see in the late 1920s and 1930s is that Mormon academic migration expands to include theological education outside the Mormon culture region. So you've got a migration of Mormon students who go to the University of Chicago's Divinity School, which is a kind of famously theologically liberal divinity school, and they're starting to bring back University of Chicago professors to teach Mormon youth about the Bible and about church history. And so Grant's comment comes at a, a bit of a contentious time, but after years of optimism um, about uh, how Mormons can can study what other theologians, what Protestant theologians have said about the Bible and what Protestant theologians have said about um, church history. And there's a tremendous optimism. So there's the sense that there's expertise out there about religion that we could benefit from. So it's, it's, it's a, re a really, yeah. you know, it's a pretty radical yeah. denial of populism that I think gives way to Grant's radical neo-populist yeah. 
assertions. And it seems like he's probably yeah. following somewhat. I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. to see J. Reuben Clark influencing him as well. And in the yeah. the speech that you mentioned, um, the charted course of, uh, of... Of education, yeah. Yeah, so uh, J. Reuben Clark is charted saying... Charted course of the church in education. Right. Yeah. Uh, on more than one occasion, our church members have gone to other places for special training. They've had the training, which was supposedly the last word, the most modern view, and they've brought it back and dosed it upon us without any thought as to whether we needed it or not. Um, and, he, and he talks about how uh, experts need to kindly consider whether their methods will spur community spirit or build religious activities among groups that are decadent. I mean, he's, he's talking yeah. about this very antagonistic uh, back and forth. And then he says, great is the burden and condemnation of any teacher who sows doubt in a trusting soul. So he's very skeptical of this. I think one yes. of the ironies here is that at the same time, this type of attitude itself could also sow doubt. Uh, in Latter Day Saints, who oh, you know, yeah. and, and you don't really explore this very much, but I I wanted to ask you about that element of things. I mean, Clark is saying, beware, don't sow doubt. But that kind of an attitude itself, especially we're seeing this more and more today, can sow doubt. Yes, you know, I've been following with real interest, um, you know, some of the writings and the some of the efforts of um, you know people like Terrell Gibbons and yeah. uh, and Patrick Mason. Uh, you know, and 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 recognizing this real issue of of doubt in the age of the internet. You know, when when people have lo- lots of access to source ma- primary source material um, and lots of access to criticisms of of uh, of church history, church Everything doctrine, really things. Like yeah, some, right. It's the internet, so right? You and a, boy, and I I think honestly, I'm I'm so glad you brought this up, Blair, because I think some of the central tensions in this history, and and again, leading up to the present day have to do with pedagogical approaches right mm-hmm. what yeah. what can young people handle yeah. and and there's this sense yeah brimhall has this sense at times and clark has this sense at times of just yeah of, of really wanting to protect mm-hmm. mormon youth um they don't and, want to see anybody lost yep which is, again completely understandable right, right. completely le- legitimate and not right? see yeah. some of the risks of right. that yeah right exactly exactly but then on the the, the scholars tend to make the argument that, um, that, and again, co- largely coming from their university experience, but also from Mormon affirmations about, again, like, look, we we need to be kind of trained. We need to exercise these muscles. The glory right? of because, God's intelligence. Yeah. It's a God-given gift. Exactly. We can, it's a talent that if you bury it in the earth, that's, yeah. you know, exactly. that's wrong. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so if we if we shelter young people too much, um, right, they're, they're not going to be they're not going to be prepared for real engagement with people from yeah. the outside. And they're, they're just not going to be living up to their potential yeah. as human beings and as, as intelligent and within beings. our own society. We, we right. won't be able to have the same types of advantages. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. So there's, there's something that goes back and forth. And I see this a lot um, in my own teaching of religious studies, largely outside the Mormon yeah. community, but there's, there's often a sense um, in religious education that, uh, that there's going to be this, this really damaging experience of disillusionment. Yeah. You know, a lot of students will say, I feel like, and this comes up in the 1911 controversy. Yeah. Um, expli- this language comes up explicitly, but people will say, I feel like it, this feels like learning that there's no Santa Claus, yeah. right? This, this the feels rug like, is pulled completely yeah, out from yeah, under Yeah, like you, if yeah. you just tug at the the fabric of the yeah. garment, the whole thing unravels. Yeah. And and so there's, yeah, there's a fear that um, that, that initiation into... Um, all that complexity is going to be um, is going to be an, an experience that that some young people can't recover from, and and so so I think it's a really it's a really interesting debate. Again, a, a fundamentally pedagogical debate. I think about what can students handle, um, where should we set the bar in terms of um, of how much we can challenge them, how can we can how much can we expose them to the complexities of of church history and the church, you know. Most recently, yeah. there. Uh, one of the Mormon apostles, M. Russell Ballard, just recently gave an address to mm-hmm. church educators that seems like the new J. Reuben Clark speech, but in this mm-hmm. one he talked about the necessity of learning. He talked about yeah. the need to to rely sometimes on expertise uh, yes. of scholars and, and said the days are gone when we can, uh, if a student has a question, we can just tell them, forget about it, everything's <laughs> yeah. okay. So right. now at right. this point, yeah. we have an, an apostle... Yeah. Giving that sort of a speech that could have that kind of a, an effect as well, yeah. like J. Urban Clark's really put a damper on yep. seeking and on on education in a lot of ways. Yeah, M. Russell Ballard is saying we need to learn. 
Right. Have, did you have you heard his address right. yet? I have not seen you, it in you, full. You've thank got you to for see it. Telling, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's almost a shame it came out now because it yeah. would have been perfect yeah. for the conclusion because yeah. it's sort of like, okay, where's this going to go? I mean, right. I it think seems like a question. bookend yeah, exactly. to the J. Ruben Clark, M. Russell exactly. Ballard. It's fascinating. Exactly, and it is, and and as uh, we've said, it's it's all fluid, you know. At the um, and and I think it'll be very interesting to see. Um, what kind of identity and space uh, Mormon scholars continue to carve out for themselves and what kind of um, parameters uh, general authorities continue to try to set. And, um, uh, you know, I'm thinking about figures, really interesting figures like uh, Greg Prince has his, you know, relatively new biography of uh, David O. McKay, yeah. you know, I'm talking about, um, you know, so he's, he's... And McKay was around during these controversies exactly, himself. Exactly. And he was so, saying like, right. you know, we, we let's do the education thing. Exactly. So there was always exactly. these internal so it's always contested. Yeah. yeah, and I really don't want to leave people at the end of the book with the impression that, that J. Ruben Clark has the final word because I, I go on to say... You know, even even as he's issuing the speech, and it does have a chilling effect, and it is still circulated today. Um, right at the same time, BYU is is developing a really strong academic department in the study of religion, um, with a lot of these Chicago uh, trained people figuring prominently. And, and the biology um, department has become a yeah, completely yeah. A, a very solid biology department even right, today. At right, BYU. And there are there are really interesting things happening at the University of Utah at the same time, of yeah. course, too. And so um, again, Clark doesn't have the final word, but I think he does end up setting up some parameters and setting up a kind of a suspicion. This goes it back all the way to the 1870s and the 1880s. But there's always a suspicion that people who go and get this outside training are gonna be. Um, are going to be trouble yeah. in one way or another, right? Right. right? So there's always it's headaches. Gonna, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're they're going to come back and they're going to try to corrupt corrupt the simple faith of young people. And these and, are concerns that we gonna, see yeah. even playing out. Uh, I think to the Absolutely. present, these kind of discussions are going to continue on. Your book yeah. is valuable precisely yeah. because it gives a history. Yeah. It gives some background to some of the discussions that we're still having today. And so yes. people who are interested in these matters. Uh, really need to check out this book and you'll see a lot of familiar things there you'll see a lot of surprising things there uh, and it's thanks to tom simpson he's written this book american universities and the birth of modern mormonism before we go the other thing i wanted to mention with, was the appendices in the book you have quite a few here that list uh, mormons who sought higher education what sort of projects do you foresee coming out of those materials it's almost oh. like you said like here here's a wealth of <laughs> Yeah. Data for you. Go yeah. have fun. Yeah, I did. Th yeah. Thank, that's exactly the spirit in which I intended it. Um, you know, I, that I had this database, essentially, and the kind of the way my life has played out in, in recent years with with um, going outside of higher education and to, to Phillips Exeter Academy. And, you know, and I'm a parent now and I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm teaching and I'm coaching and yeah. I'm living in a dorm. And and I just I don't know to what extent. I'll follow through on this material. And I just, I had the sense that I wanted to share it with people and say, and it's already happening. I think, you know, already, you know, Lisa Olson Tate has yeah. identified who cactus is yeah. and, and already. Um, and, and, uh, and I've just thought that, you know, energetic Mormon studies exactly, community. That wants it is. To... And I just thought if I put this out there, maybe, you know, it would generate ideas uh, for other projects. And, and I think the fundamental argument, you know, I wanted people to have this history. I wanted you know, I get the sense sometimes I'll see something come through on Facebook and, you know, and somebody will say, well, somebody, you know, a Mormon scholar just said this kind of controversial thing about evolution. And I think, oh my gosh, if you only knew like yeah. how far back, you know, and, and yeah, how, yeah. exactly. And so I just, I think, so th there's this revisionist and debatable argument that the Mormon sense of belonging takes root in the American university. Yeah. Like that's the basic argument. But even if people are hesitant about buying that argument completely they'll have this history and these stories yeah. um, go find these people it's lists of yeah. people who went and received education and lists of the the theses and dissertations that they exactly. wrote and all sorts of things for exactly people to so yeah into. i think people could go and look at like look at all the dissertations you know all the all the projects that just those university of chicago yeah. divinity school students were writing or or people who were writing really academic and professional history of Mormonism um, in many ways for the first time. And, and you, you can see these disciplines and these, um, I think there's, there's a, a real genealogy of Mormon intellectual life and scholarly yeah. attainment here that I think... And it's a nice little add-on to the yeah. end of the book there. Yeah, so. yeah. What about you, Tom? Uh, yeah. Any project you're working on now? You said you're teaching and what else? Yeah, have you got I am, anything else you know, going uh, on? Uh, I, in recent years, have become 
just absolutely immersed in what's going on in post-war Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and I, I was directing a travel program back in 2004 that, that took me there, a program that looks at the intersections of religion and violence and peace building. And so I have uh, started writing creative nonfiction essays about the stories that I've heard in Bosnia that have have taught me so much about human capacity, the human capacity for evil and the human capacity for compassion. Um, and it's really affected me profoundly and deeply. So it's creative nonfiction, you're trying to reach a broad audience with I this. I am, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've published a couple of essays in a Canadian literary magazine called Numeral Sank. Uh, and they've been incredibly encouraging. Um, and so the, the next project is a collection of these essays about encountering post-war Bosnia as an outsider mm -hmm. over the last 12 years. Now mm -hmm. I've taken five trips in the last oh, 12 wow. years. I'm going back in March. I'm going to be working with teachers over in Bosnia who are trying to develop critical thinking and writing skills in youth in Bosnia as a way of imagining alternatives to aggression. So this, uh, is, this yeah. book is such an echo then. Like you're, yeah. <laughs> you've, you've really, you're operating these two completely different you spheres. Know, well, in, now, in right? some ways, and I think, I think what ties them is a real faith in educational institutions to transform lives. Yeah. You know, and I really, so I really believe, I've seen in my life, in my teaching, I've experienced it as a college student, and then I see it in a residential boarding school, hmm. um, that's redundant, Sorry. In, a, yeah. in, a, in a boarding school. Um, I've seen how when people leave home and they, and they come from lots of different backgrounds and they, they knit a community together, there's a kind of camaraderie and loyalty that develops that, that doesn't develop in many other cultural spaces. I don't think you spend four years together. Yeah. You, there's this love that develops for each other, this love that develops for the teachers who have taken care of you. Yeah. And so I think that that's, um, that, that's what Bosnia is trying to reconstruct is, you know, can we reconstruct these institutions that form youth who will, who will feel taken care of, who will, who will want to stay? Yeah. I mean, brain drain is a huge, yeah. huge issue yeah. there. But um, so it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's a real, faith and confidence that I have in the power of educational mm. institutions to change lives. Thomas W. Simpson, thank you so much for taking time to be on the podcast today. Thank you, Blair. It's an honor.